for those of you like me who have like teenagers, uh, story of trust, yeah, it'll never clean up your room when they tell you. Uh, and that's basically also a part of this talk. Uh, nerd alert, this was from a previous uh, conference, but I guess here it's, there's no alert. Everybody, <laughs> everybody's here. Uh, and like to put the scope down, uh, we really only gonna focus on putting things from source to production, so not running in production, because that's another field of dealing with tampering and so on. Uh, we're, I'm not gonna tell you like scary stories about security because you know that's all too easy. You all know that's important. I don't have to explain that to you. Uh, I'm not talking about changing hardware because that's another vector, uh, you know, uh, nationwide attacks. I'm not gonna <coughs> go there as well. Uh, I'm not talking about like human engineering or kind of tricking you into doing stuff that you don't wanna do. Uh, I'm not talking about physical bypassing, access to your server rooms, you know, <laughs> trying to compress the talk as much as I can. Uh, I'm not talking about key management, uh, although it's like important, and here at FOSDEM, you probably uh, want to manage uh, the stuff as well. Um, not talking about hardening your servers. Uh, okay, so we're almost there. What I'm you know, gonna talk about, tampering, changing things, unauthorized changes, uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I leave this slide in here because promise theory, for those who know it, there's a lot of the word trust, trust, trust in there, but trust through verification. And that's gonna be the crux of the talk. Like how do we verify the stuff as well? I don't have an answer for everything. So this is a research talk. There's gonna be a lot all over the place of things I found. So I hope in next iterations of the talk, I will get better at providing solutions as well. So, but I went as far as I could from what I know right now in my research. Um, so we're gonna start with you know, the laptop. It's, I know it's a curse to put like a Mac here at an open source conference, but that's a lot of the reality. Uh, and we gotta trust already the hardware vendor, we gotta trust Apple, we gotta trust the operating system. So I'm gonna take that as a starting point. The developer's laptop with the certificate authority is on there, you know, with everything in there and it's updated. So I kind of start from there. Um, these days, a lot of the development is actually assembling more and more libraries. Uh, you know, uh, if you're doing some development on a Mac, uh, there's the App Store, there's Docker, uh, NPM if you're Node, Homebrew, because you know, Apple doesn't provide all the tools you actually need. So you know, it's nice to have the community, but we depend on a lot of other libraries to actually to even start our job and get the information before we can even start developing. So the first thing we trust is kind of all these kind of uh, external dependencies. And most of them are actually based on, you know, some form of TLS verification uh, chain of trust. Um, and uh, well, you know, I don't have to explain it to the disk crowd, any configuration, ciphers, uh, you know, all that stuff, uh, certificates uh, that we think that is happening underneath because you know we're using HTTPS and it should magically be taken care of, right? Um, obviously, you know, leaked or rogue CA certificates, but you know that's another story. We we'll leave that to the pros um, and all the ciphers and so on. Um, if you, uh, so I'm taking this example of a Node app trying to push that to production, um, like. The node, by default, has a lot of ciphers it supports. So it has to support it because it's quite open. Uh, so we're trusting it, but we can get better at you know, putting this down. It's, it's as easy even as putting some environment variables and kind of saying these ones we don't want. So it's a simple thing you can do if you don't uh, want to just rely on node, just doing stuff uh, in there as well. Um, I have to take my glasses on and off, I'm sorry. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of the, we think about certificates being validated. Yes, most of the time it actually validates whether the certificate has been expired, but it doesn't look at revocations. So, um, for example, you know, you can, uh, uh, what is it, CRLs and so on, you can verify it, but in, several of the libraries, it is just not available. Um, Let's Encrypt has uh, kind of made this better, uh, but we're still not there yet. Um, if you wanna go a step further, you know, 
you look at the SSL, the certificate is valid, uh, you look at the revocation stuff. Uh, the next step is actually, like, what other certificates got created for my domain? Uh, uh, Facebook provides, like, a nice interface uh, to kind of check whatever uh, certificate that was created uh, in your domain. So that's a way of detecting rock certificates being created under your domain uh, that you can validate. So you can put a webhook on there, uh, monitor your domain, and kind of get information about things, uh, certificates being created there as well. And if you want to go step one step further, you can put in DNS the CAA record that actually says, well, if this record, uh, if this certificate has been created, by which authority has it been created? Because maybe there's some dodgy kind of CAA that creates a certificate for your domain, but here you can specify it in DNS, which ones do you trust? I'm not saying this is widely used, but it's like one of the trust verification system uh, we can use uh, in the system. So we, we kind of, you know, I went a little bit deeper on HTTPS and validation than usual. Yes, you know, HTTPS and we're, we're happy. Kind of a, a couple of things we could do. But obviously there's the next problem is kind of, is DNS, right? Because we want to do a request, but we want to do a DNS request. And um, well, I'm, I'm sorry to say it still isn't solved. And many would think like DNSSEC is kind of the answer. But if you look at what a few of the major ones, like NPM and GitHub, don't have DNSSEC enabled. So that was a surprise to me. I was like thinking, yeah, this is DNSSEC. You know, everybody should be doing it. I know it's hard, but I would have expected these companies uh, to be doing it. Um, even curl doesn't check it. Like, there's like a six-year-old open pull request to do it. Like. My trust in curl has gone way down. I'm, I'm not saying it's not a good tool, but uh, obviously it's people, but the more you look at the things under the hood, the, the, the scarier things uh, kind of getting uh, there as well. And then, oh no, okay, we, we got the HTTPS out of the way, we kind of trust that, we got the DNS, we, we kind of assume that trust as well. And then the next thing we do is like a homebrew says us, like, you know, run this kind of Ruby execute from GitHub on your laptop. How many have done that? Yeah, scary, right? <laughs> um, so I don't know why we, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't seem to, you know, be able to get better to do it. Uh, there's a, a tool I found like pipe this that allows you to actually view whatever has been piped to the bash command that you can review the commands being executed, gives you some kind of uh, visibility of the things that are happening. Uh, but again, like we, we just take that for granted, right? So homebrew, right, uh, let's do it. Um, Node is a little bit better in a way that at least we can do the curl bio, uh, download and check the validity of the binaries. Uh, they have GPG enabled, so which is nice. Uh, but, uh, okay, I'm just gonna go back on this slide, nope, okay. But it, it still is kind of a, a whole ceremony to go through, right? Um, I rarely do it, but it's like one of those things. It should almost get baked into the tool somehow in the future uh, as a step that just says, I downloaded it, it's validated, it does all the checks. Currently across all the uh, package repositories, there's no standard way. Everybody does it differently and you kind of have to figure out, and sometimes it's not even well documented, and you have to spend a lot of time to actually verify the stuff. Uh, Docker was an interesting one. Um, I wanted to have Docker desktop on my laptop. I could not find it, check some, somewhere on a website that was able to verify the DMG that I was downloading. Uh, the only way I could verify it was if I install it on my Mac using uh, App Store, and then I could verify the signature, and that was documented. But then again, we go through the chain of trust that we have to trust like Apple and, and kind of go around that. So that was a little bit surprising for me to see, you know, we can kind of do that with a Docker binary and uh, verify that as well. Um, okay, I, I got like Node, I got like Docker, a homebrew. So now, you know, I'm gonna install some libraries, right? Um, if you look at libraries, how do you 
think that a library is secure, right? Oh, if it, there was like a million people using it, it's secure. Uh, if it's like been there a long time, it's secure. So I haven't really found a good way. Uh, obviously, it's kind of like verifying multiple vectors, um, but there is no kind of good way to verify it. There's a lot of vulnerability scanners that will report these CVEs or something on something. But if it's like a library not well known or a new thing, it's like really hard to verify unless you kind of download or compile everything from scratch yourself uh, and go from there. Um, NPM install is interesting because it actually, you know, like many of the package managers, just runs also scripts when you do that. So you can change a lot of stuff on your laptop as well. So you can, for example, uh, use npm install with ignore scripts and say, well, don't run it and get like a preview of the scripts it's going to execute and then do the execution. So it's like an extra layer you can verify uh, what is actually going on uh, underneath. Uh, it's, it's very clunky. Um, of course, we don't want to have like, a, you know, advertising in npm. Uh, who remembers this happening? Nobody? So uh, for a while, when you did npm install, instead of only giving you the packages that it installed, it will just show advertising in your CLI tool. There was a lot of debate of something happening, but it, it kind of you know, shows you what these package managers could do to your system if you know, there's somebody who wants to do some uh, stuff with it. Um, so you, you kind of do the scanning, you find all the bugs. Uh, one of the problems, obviously, is kind of all the dependencies in the libraries, like a bug could be uh, DDoSing it, but you're using it internally. So even with all the scanner tools, it's really hard to figure out like what, what do, where do I spend my time patching? So th uh, that's you know, one of the, the problems, prioritization uh, to do that. Um, you can take a step further of the scanning of libraries and do it at a proxy level, like JFrog x -ray, allows you to do the scanning and not allow you when you download the packages through an upstream repo and that they're like secure or verified or not. So you don't have to do it on your laptop. Obviously you have to trust <laughs> uh, JFrog X-Ray, but it's kind of a, another layer of control you can uh, put there as well. Um, so this was just to point out that Homebrew, the only thing it actually does is like looking at the checksum of the tarball or something it downloads. So the actual recipe, or was it the brew, that itself is not signed. And the maintainer said, we're not doing that. We're an open source project. We don't have time for that. That was basically kind of the answer. So it's, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, on something we've used, we're using so much on our laptops to, to install stuff that this is kind of the state where we are. Um, you know, Node is a little bit better. They kind of signed their, um, their dependencies as well. They have like checksums, but you can see like, this is all manual steps that you need to go through, but at least you can verify it. You can get their GPG keys. You can verify the stuff, uh, so that's nice. And obviously when you commit things yourself, you can sign the signatures uh, with your GPG key and uh, push things to Git. But, there's a, I found an interesting project that allows you actually like uh, multi-comments or what is it, multi-submitters uh, that you do in Git, that there is like a uh, solution for multi-signing it, uh, a commit. So not only one person, and then you can say, well, before it goes into production, multiple people have to sign that commit before it actually goes out. So that's another way of uh, verifying uh, things there as well. You know, if you're using GitHub or something similar, you, when you push things, these fingerprints of the official host keys are actually documented, so you can verify those as well, uh, instead of just saying, yes, I trust, first trust, and push it to the server as well. It can kind of be like any, anything that has like a SSH key at that point, uh, you can uh, kind of uh, push to, but at least here you can verify the official ones. Um, that brings me kind of to, uh, Principle of tough. I, who has heard of tough? Few people. So it's kind of known in um, more in the Docker sphere. It's spreading towards 
uh, more of the applications and the package distributions. Uh, so it's, it's tough stands for the update framework. So they kind of made some principles and some guidelines of people pushing things to repos. Um, so the separation of uh, uh, duties, more like you know one multiple keys and not one key to kind of uh, push things. Thresholds, much like the Git uh, commit signing, they do the similar thing. Like multiple people, uh, depending on the step, have to kind of say yes, not only one. Uh, so that builds like the consensus, much like um, uh, what was it the certificate thing I talked about. Uh, the revocation of keys is really important, so it's built into the framework that they can fast rotate keys uh, to make sure that there is like no delay. Uh, offline keys, so the root keys don't need to be active all the time, so they can be on offline storage, and then the trust goes up for more like shorter keys. Uh, to be there and no need for the key sharing so everybody can kind of delegate a key to somebody else depending on what uh, the job they do so there's a principle look it up the the tough the update framework uh, you know I'm just rushing over here but it, it's an interesting read as a, a concept uh, and this is what actually is used by docker notary when you want to have push uh, images uh, in uh, you know that are signed and secure those principles are used by Docker Notary. So you create a key, you sign it very much like uh, any of the package uh, repositories as well. <coughs> and then you can expect uh, whether it's signed with or correct to like you would do with a git commit, but now with a Docker image as well. This actually has saved uh, a major breach on the Docker hub by uh, requiring multiple people to do a certain step. One of the keys got compromised, but they recovered in a way because they had this uh, principle uh, available in, in, in the setup. We've talked about, you know, node code or any of, you know, Ruby or whatever code. We talked about uh, Docker images, but there is also something you can do for um, verification uh, for, uh, for example, for JavaScript libraries in the browser. So you can build a checksum and you can make sure that there's an integrity check when the code gets executed in the browser as well. So it's, it's you know, the, the, the checksumming and so on, we just keep going um, and we can verify more and more. So that's a good thing. I'm taking it even further. We talked about code, uh, but you know, this is probably the simplest uh, way in the days when I was running Apache, like minus T was my friend to validate the code or the config as well. I'm not saying this is the trust, but at least it gives you some kind of idea of what is happen, happening. And if you want to take that further, now with something like TFSec, we can basically check your uh, Terraform code uh, to validate if there's something happening that shouldn't be happening as well. Um, I think that's getting powerful, more in cloud configs, that we can actually do that verification as well. Um, taking it one step further, so I'm just going up and up. <laughs> so what if I don't trust my laptop every time I do some stuff? Uh, I think uh, Jess Roselli has coined this idea of running every application inside of a Docker container on the desktop, 2015. This was uh, a blog post. Uh, now there's been a couple, you know, Visual Studio Code, you develop code inside your containers, and then we get better at uh, exporting, like debugging it from remote. Uh, you know, uh, Fedora has a, a similar project. Um, and something like CubeOS goes a step further. They even give like every application, the way I understand it, they give every application their own network stack, their own everything. Uh, and everything stays like separate and <coughs> ephemeral, uh, and it's actually used uh, in for journalists to make sure that when they're putting things in the news, that they have like a safe environment, uh, wide where they can edit stuff, uh, and they can kind of uh, make sure that it hasn't been tampered with. So one of the points is that I know a lot of people say you know servers, cattle, not pets, but I think we're going the direction that it's going to be the same for the desktops. I have. When I said that, I heard like developers screaming, like I, I'm, I cannot have my own autonomy and so on. And it's like, yeah, I've heard that before, like 10 years ago uh, on the server world, uh, giving pets names. We were just discussing that, like Pokemon names or whatever. <laughs> um, 
So we got the code verified. We're pushing it now, hopefully, to the CI, uh, or uh, we, we pushed it to the Git repo, and now hopefully the CI kicks in. But what's interesting is that this often is outside our control. So it's like who watches the watchers, who trusts the people we trust. So it's, it's, uh, this is a nice paper to read if you want to know more. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows that project. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, it's just, you know, it's in a fun way. It shows like anything can happen in your CI system that you, you don't know that's going to happen uh, as well. Um, and that makes you think like if you use like a SaaS solution, how do we get that same trust? We, we can't verify the binaries. We can't do everything. We pay them or we use them and we just assume they're secure. So that's like a big leap up. Uh, and I, I haven't got any, you know, perfect solution for it, but there's uh, obviously they get better at exposing what they do. So they show you the images they run your builds on. They share that officially, but we don't have any idea where they're running this image. <laughs> so it's, it's still like, it's better. Um, some have a solution to run things on-prem, so they would do the same orchestration but they run it on your machines, so at least you can kind of get audit logs, kind of see what commands get executed, so it's not perfect. Uh, some would have like a, um, uh, more of a, um, they would op officially announce that there was an audit of the code, so that's kind of how more and more uh, they are uh, building trust. Um, some would allow you to limit the IP addresses. Let's say if your build system is remote, they have you push things to your environment, that at least you only allow the IP addresses of the people who are pushing something to you. Um, and this is a nice you know, little trick. Uh, for example, if you use any of the uh, AWS CLI tools, you can change the user agent and you can have like an EIM profile that says like only this user agent is allowed. So you can turn that into an almost random key by obscurity that allows you to kind of say, well, nobody else, even if, though they have like the AWS credentials, can actually use that if they don't know uh, the, uh, the, the random key that you put here. I'm not saying this is secure, but it's like uh, one step more. The people from uh, the Bitcoin system, they went a step further. So they just went with, what if we have multiple people compile it and then verify if this gives us the same result? And then if most of the people get the same result, we assume that is the best result. And then we put the checksum in. So not only one checksum, because your tooling might be infected and just changing it there as well. So I found that a nice way. We, we sometimes think about multi-cloud. What about multiple CI? What about using two CI systems? And then do like verification and see if both kind of created the same thing. Uh, again, it's like thinking. Uh, I'm not saying this is actually being done, but it, it gives you some inspiration. But this brings us to the hard point of doing reproducible builds, which isn't really that easy because Let's say you have like a, a, a something uh, like a, a, a time in your banner or your header or uh, whatever, and you're kind of recompiling it. The next time you compile it, you know the binary will be different, uh, or the flags from from the compiler or anything there. So um, Debian has spent a lot of time on making packages and builds reproducible. Um, Node. If I run it twice on my same laptop with the same compiler in the same settings, the binary or whatever it builds uh, will not give me the same checksum. So it's something that I found interesting to, to, to see. Uh, we would think like a checksum, this is kind of what we do. Um, one more step further, what about uh, the operating system itself? Um, it turns out that uh, this was from a FOSDEM talk. Um, to build a Linux, nowadays you have to have a Linux, right? So somewhere we lost the link from being completely from scratch to build the Linux system. Uh, sometimes you see like bootstrap one, two, three, when you do like GCC compiling, like some of the bootstrapping is binary only. 
So people are still working on making that code as well. So it's, it's sometimes hard to verify uh, to do that. If you want to have a look at this, uh, this is, I think there was a talk uh, earlier today on that as well, UX SD, like all the dependencies of the libraries. It's not that easy as it looks. <laughs> uh, and even like the bootstrapping assembler uh, that, you know, people are working on that just to have like a from source verifiable compiler uh, to make things happen. I'm going to skip that slide, that slide, All right. So we kind of said, well, make it repeatable, make it repeatable, and then the hackers say, fantastic. Now I can detect every binary because if I look at the checksum, I know what binary it is. So then this company said, well, you know what? We're going to build a wrapper that randomizes the checksums again <laughs> to run it in production, and then we map it on the static uh, uh, checksums again. So it's kind of, you know, we're going round and round, but you know we're getting better. Um, the checksumming is one thing. I talked about uh, thinking about all the dependencies. I think this is where Google Bazel comes in. That they, instead of saying reproducible builds, which build the same binary, they're working on uh, the concept of hermetic builds, where all the dependencies that you need in the build for your Docker image or whatever, they are specified. It is not just app get update or something. They kind of try to do that as well. And not only for your dependencies, but all your, also for your compiling tool chain. So Bazel will download a known set of compilers so that everybody in your team will use the same compilers and do the same installation as well. Uh, and that brings us, you know, the attack factors quite often, the discussion is on containers, like, oh, there's so much in the container and then there's so much vulnerabilities, and they're actually going the direction, what if we only need like one binary in the container? So distroless, and that, you know, makes it a lot more difficult to do any attack factor uh, there. This is what some people are working on. So we, when we know all the dependencies, we kind of have like a bill of material, you know, like a, the ingredient list. This code has been built with these dependencies and so on. Uh, well, there's many tools that allow you to reverge engineer Docker files because it's sometimes not that easy and you don't know what's inside. Uh, you can take multiple approaches, either from forensics or reverse engineering. Uh, they're all in the notes. You can check that later. So some interesting stuff. But, you know, it's stupid that we throw away all the meta information while building and then have to reverse engineer it again. Uh, I, in my past company, I worked on uh, video stuff. And it's almost like uh, when you have a DVD, I know that's getting old, uh, with subtitles, you know, and you have to reverse engineer it from the image. But it will, that's actually stupid. Um, Intoto is a new, uh, not new, but it goes one step further. They actually not only specify the dependency sources, but also the steps that they took while doing uh, the build. So they would sign every step of the build so you can verify what happened during the build as well. And then Graphias in the DockerX system can use all that metadata to decide whether something should run in production or not uh, based on what has been in the image. When a new vulnerability comes out, they can kind of say, well, you know, this is kind of uh, something that is, has been built. Now we know there's a, uh, a severity one, so you, you have to do about it. But that's something that can be integrated there as well. <laughs> but obviously, you know, it never ends, and we just keep going um, there as well. Uh, so I'm getting toward the end of my talk. Um, I know all the tools that I've shown you are so hard to use, right? And um, sometimes I think about it, um, we fought, fought so hard to get the right to vote, but then you would say, well, well I don't want to vote, right? And it's a little bit like this. We fought so hard about getting the freedom for, you know, uh, using, sharing libraries, and so on. And I think we kind of have to get better at the verification step because, you know, that's one of the duties we have as well to make our ecosystem uh, more secure uh, in there. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with the transparency, transparency, building consensus, so not like one 
a group saying yes or no, uh, but work on there as well. Um, so I think that was basically my talk. I don't know if we have time for questions. Okay, anyone? Yeah, okay. What do you think about commit signing? Mm-hmm. I know there's uh, quite some debate whether it's useful or not. Uh, yeah. Uh, but um, I think um, if you automate it, that's one of the problems. Uh, because if it's, if it's just like uh, I will do the, from what I understand, the, the argument is about when you automate the step, then it's no use because it's, uh, uh, there is no real verification in happening. I don't know if, uh, if you have another idea on, on there. For instance, not to build something that is not uh, signed properly. Mm -hmm. Prevent building code that is not signed. Yeah, signed. but sometimes you have to, I guess. No? Is it possible? Are there any tools that, that they can use to prevent uh, build something that is that checked? Oh, I, okay. I think the question was, uh, is there a... a two questions. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to repeat the second one. So uh, that, uh, that can prevent... Um, a build from happening if some, the, the, the commit hasn't been signed. Uh, I think that is probably looking at the verification and then putting an exit code. I don't know, I haven't come across uh, any specific tool in there, so. so. Yeah. Uh, well, it's very interesting, by the way. Thank, Thank you. For the presentation it was really, really good. Uh, you, you talk about the pipeline. What happened with what is already in production? Yeah, okay, so that's another talk, like I said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there, uh, because I think that's more dangerous, actually. No? It is more dangerous, uh, but um, I think it, it, it's a, it's another you know it's another aspect of, of looking at things. Uh, I I in, I think here I want to go in the prevention mode mm -hmm. and not in the you know. But even if you go into prevention mode, you, I mean the, the hacker. Uh, sure. Is, is quite fast. I mean, yes. the community is quite fast to try to find vulnerabilities and things that are disclosed already, but the companies didn't have time to patch it. Yes, yeah. So how do you inform that company? But, but the visibility of knowing what is running production, mm. uh, and I'm not talking about intrusion detection or logging or auditing, but if you know what is happening and you can at least know, check the vulnerability databases and get some of the tools that do that, you, get, you are better informed whether you should kind of no patch zero day or kind of as fast as possible. Uh, I'm not saying you don't have to protect your servers anymore, but at least the visibility is it's what I tr try to show here. If you verify and get things visible, at least you can see it. If you don't know it, you just, yeah, you live in happiness. <laughs> so that must, might be good as well, so. <laughs> One more question and then we have to One more, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is what um, I think uh, most of the distro, uh, the, the package managers are using. Um, uh, my, yeah, my question is if the file is like uh, downloaded over HTTPS connection already, and then I use a checksum from the same source to check the downloaded file against, besides accidental transmission errors, would that provide any additional security? Like if no. from my template with the file itself? It depends. It could, it could not, right? Um, if you're saying, um, if, if I have like an S3 re repository and my binary is here and my checksum is here, you know, on the same bucket and I have access, you know, yes, I can alter both. So that's not really a solution. But if I have the checksums on a website, something else on a different system and I have my binaries here, yes, it makes sense. No, but it depends what you define as same source. Is it the same company? Is it another company? Is it the same website, same server? So it's kind of depending on, you know, the more the, the more people are seeing it, the, 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 the better it gets there. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Find the other one.